Okay, so we're going to get started with the next speaker. And I do not know why that sounds funny. Um, so it's my, my pleasure, truly, to introduce Keith Waldron. Um, so Keith is a physiotherapist in the state of New York in the United States. After initially obtaining his master's degree in physical therapy in 2000, Keith later returned to academics, earning his doctorate in physical therapy in 2007. Over the course of the last 17 years, Keith has worked in a variety of settings, including public and private schools, outpatient clinics, and home care. Since 2012, he's provided physiotherapy care exclusively in the home, working jointly with skilled nursing, occupational therapy, medical social service professionals, um, and medical social service professionals to comprehensively address the patient's medical needs and social needs. And also I'd like to share just a little personal story about how San Diego Pain Summit has kind of been awesome in so many ways. The first time I came to this um, conference, I was sitting in the back row, but then on social media, obviously there's much chatter. Um, someone kept posting pictures from behind me. Um, it was this guy from New York I knew from online, and I was like, oh my God, are you here? But then I realized there was no one behind me, and it completely creeped me out. Um, <laughs> but then, the next year he actually came. So online um, streaming people, it is tons of fun if you can get yourself here to meet all of the people who are here in the room, um, because honestly, like the, the virtual world and the real world are just kind of all the same, and it's way better in person. So. I'm really happy to have Keith here in person. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, so as some of you may know, I am a once frequent, now less frequent uh, physiotherapy blogger who initially cut his social media teeth in the early 2010s as a member, contributor, and eventually unsuccessful moderator at somasimple.com. And it's during those countless hours that I was on Soma Simple, and I do mean countless hours. That's where I first met Rajam, and I became acquainted with a lot of other people who have actually presented here in the past or in here this weekend. Uh, Diane Jacobs, Todd Hargrove, Corey Blickenstaff. Uh, and one of the people that I also met there uh, was Barrett Dorco, who's presented here in the past as well. And while his somewhat curmudgeonly social media persona uh, might have rubbed some people the wrong way over the last few years. Uh, he remains the most influential person in my professional life. Uh, and when I was preparing for this talk, uh, I reached out to him uh, by letter in advance. And if I'd like to take a moment uh, to share a little bit of that letter with you, if you'll indulge me. I wrote, Dear Barrett, I think I'm in over my head. When Rajam approached me last year to speak in 2019, I hesitated. Actually, I, I said no. I didn't have anything to offer. I didn't belong on a stage, and I certainly didn't belong behind a lectern. At least that's what I was thinking until I wasn't. One person tried to talk me into it, then another, and then another, and you sure as hell didn't try to talk me out of it when I approached you about the subject. So next thing I knew, I was submitting a proposal which Rajam quickly accepted. But now, with less than four months until the date of my talk, I'm having second thoughts. I don't consider myself an expert in working with patients with pain. Shit, that's why I still travel to San Diego every winter, and, and the weather. Um, <laughs> I go to San Diego so that I can learn from people who are smarter than me. But I'm not a researcher. I'm definitely not the smartest person in the room, especially that room. I haven't published any papers or books, not even a chapter. I'm not a lecturer. I don't sell continuing education courses. I'm not especially charismatic. I stumble over my own words. What the hell does a meager physiotherapy trained home health administrator in a three county regional home care agency in the middle of nowhere have to offer some of the brightest and progressive minds in massage, physio, occupational therapy, chiropractics or medicine? Hell, my own staff tuned me out when I disseminated the American Physical Therapy Association's home health pain management materials, and I was a co-author. <laughs> I suppose I probably shouldn't lead with any of that, right? I don't know what people want to hear or how they want to hear it. I mean, hell, I'm going to be presenting on the same stage as Antonio Damasio. Descartes' error was one of my first introduction to some of the neuroscience literature when I first got the itch to really pursue some readings on the subject. 
I loved reading that book and pondering about the differences between feelings and emotions and what that might mean for our patients in pain. Now I'll be standing on the same stage at a conference. No pressure or anything, right? When the schedule was released, the first thing I did was check to see if I had to go on after him. <laughs> Thankfully, I don't. Uh, but I do have to follow Tim Beam, so win some, lose some, I guess. When I think about it, though, I suppose that there really is no good time for me to speak. There's no good spot to be scheduled. The fact of the matter is, is that I'm swinging well above my weight, Barrett, and I've decided to blame you. I blame your daily blog entries on Soma Simple, especially that damned but brilliantly simple aphorism. It should be plastered over the desktop of every clinician, professional, and human being who works with patients with painful complaints. It resonates with me still. You wrote, when the primary complaint is pain, the treatment of pain should be primary. I remember sitting at my home office PC while I read those words. I just leaned back in my chair, looked up at the ceiling, and said, oh, fuck. <laughs> Instantly, I realized that I had been doing things wrong, and I had been wanting oh so badly to be doing things right. I, I read and I searched more. I read Gifford's evolutionary reasoning chapter and topical issues on pain, and I was floored by how wrong my misconception of pain had been. I read Melzack's Neuromatrix paper, I was all in. There are a couple guys in Australia who've published a book that tried to explain things in a way that made sense too. <laughs> I felt empowered. I was explaining pain to anyone who would listen, which turned out to be not too many people, uh, which, is a, which is of course how I ended up in home health. Um, that's your fault too, you know. But I won't blame you for my move into middle management. That one's my fault alone. But you encouraged me to read, you encouraged me to write, to empathize, to wear a necktie, to write again after I had stopped, to become less hairdresser, more therapist. You encouraged me to think critically, to pay attention to everything, to become more than I was, to strive to be the most well-read person in the room, to develop a premise. And damn you in that notion of premise, Barrett. I've spent the last five years trying to develop a premise that makes sense to me, but the more I learn and the deeper I dive, the less sense it all makes. And don't mistake me, I'm unquestionably in a better place now than I was before. For instance, I'm thankful for you bringing my attention to the essay by Rachel Naomi Rem entitled, In the Service of Life. Her brief writing remains one of the most important things that I've ever read. I was reminded of it often last year at San Diego, but at no time more than during the patient experience panel when the mother of a teenager with chronic pain desperately sought guidance from the panel. I was walking the room that day. I handed her the microphone and knelt down beside her before she bravely stood up in the middle of a large room in front of hundreds of people and, str and strangers in San Diego and online, exposed, tearful, exasperated, and at a loss. When she stood up, she didn't know how to help her daughter. She returned to her seat, still powerless, still carrying the same burden that she'd brought with her. Her emotion and humility laid in stark contrast to the righteous and self-congratulatory tone emanating from the summit's participants. Of course, I was one of those folks, uh, maybe even the most righteous. I don't know, but I was acting as a good physio because I was seeking information on the latest in research and theories about the treatment of pain. While there were countless physios participating in scientifically unsubstantiated continuing education courses that same weekend on skin scraping, kinesio taping, visceral manipulation, postural syndromes, we were learning legitimate stuff, important stuff, cutting edge stuff. We were the smart ones, that's why we were there. But if we were so fucking smart, why the hell was that mother still crying when she sat back in her seat with no better direction than before she had risen? It occurs to me now that she came to the summit with a false premise, and it isn't her fault. It's the same premise that most clinicians work from. She came to the 2018 summit thinking that we offered help, but we don't. Not really, anyway, and when we do, we're doing our jobs wrong, I think. I suspect that she was disappointed at best. I dare not think of how she felt or what she thought at worst. The problem, of course, is that we shouldn't aim to help. 
20 years ago, Remen asked us if perhaps the real question is not how can I help, but how can I serve? Most of the time, our professions fail to see the distinction. Other times, we simply fail to acknowledge it. But the distinction is an important one, one that we should keep at the forefront of our minds when we engage with our patients. Remen wrote, quote, serving is different from helping. Helping is based on inequality. It is not a relationship between equals. When you help, you use your own strength to help someone of lesser strength. If I'm attentive to what is going on inside of me when I'm helping, I find that I'm always helping someone who is not as strong as I am, who is needier than I am. People feel this inequality. When we help, we may inadvertently take away from people more than we could ever give them. We diminish their self-esteem, their sense of worth, their integrity, their wholeness. When I help, I am very aware of my own strength, but we don't serve with our own strength. We serve with ourselves. We draw from all of our experiences. Our limitations serve. Our wounds serve. Even our darkness can serve. The wholeness in us serves the wholeness in others and the wholeness in life. The wholeness in you is the same as the wholeness in me. Service is a relationship between equals. She continues to say, quote, serving is also different from fixing. When I fix a person, I perceive them as broken and their brokenness requires me to act. When I serve, I see and trust that wholeness. It is what I'm responding to and collaborating with. If helping is an experience of strength, fixing is an experience of mastery and expertise. Service, on the other hand, is an experience of mystery, surrender, and awe. A fixer has the illusion of being casual. We fix and help many things in our lifetimes, but when we serve, we are always serving the same thing. Everyone who has ever served through the history of time serves the same thing. She finishes her essay by providing us with the realization that she's writing from a, perspe a perspective excuse me, that we should all hear, consider, and contemplate when she says, quote, in 40 years of chronic illness, I have been helped by many people and fixed by a great many others who did not recognize my wholeness. All that fixing and help me left me wounded in some important and fundamental ways. Only service heals. I think I'll argue that genuine and authentic service is what happens in the inner subjective space. The third space is what Quintner calls it. It's the same space that I had hoped that could be rescued from the bio, psycho, social, reductive splintering of a patient's personhood. And yeah, I know that some folks think that I'm tilting at windmills here, but, I, and I've had conversations with people, again, that are far smarter than I am who think the distinction isn't meaningful. Um, maybe they're right, but I can't help but think that referring to our approach as humanistic rather than biopsychosocial, it has the potential, at least for pedantics like myself, to actively remind oneself that their patient is an emergent being, not the sum of a few discrete parts that can be itemized and categorized in research studies and patient charts. In such a manner, Matthew Lowe, the physio involved with cause health across the pond, has spoken and written eloquently about using a dispositional clinical approach to his physio practice. I can't help but think he's onto something. He too uses the term humanistic to describe his care, but he does so with a little bit more fanfare than I ever could. And that's a good thing, I think, because he deserves the, the praise. And come to think of it, I should encourage Rajam to invite him in 2020. As best I understand it, which might mean not much at all, the dominant view or model of causation in science and medicine is derived from the philosophy of Hume, who proposed that we really can't say one thing causes another, only that two events seem to occur in succession, one follows another. This line of thinking seems to be a good fit with how medicine studies patients and interventions. It's the stuff that RCTs are born from, after all. Our studies are seeking for and investigating regularities, not causes. And most philosophers agree that regularity cannot usually be determined from a single instance. So usually we need a multitude of instances or events to begin to see patterns of regularity, to begin to say that one event follows another. This is how we end up with and derive our hierarchy of evidence, you know, that, that pyramid that informs us that case studies carry less weight or evidence than cross-sectional studies, eventually ascending to RCTs and systematic reviews at the top of the pyramid, the apex of the quality of evidence, because the bigger the sample, the more confidence we have in the regularities that we discover or not. One challenge to these methods of study, however, is that 
they only, they only tell us about people and interventions on average. They don't tell us about a specific patient in specific circumstances. No, we must rely on the wisdom of the clinician for responsible clinical application of research findings with each individual patient. Of course, another reason that we prefer these RCTs is that there's less risk of bias because the studies are conducted with increasing rigor as we ascend the hierarchy of evidence as well. But that isn't necessarily the case. What we fail to recognize is that the implicit bias, that causation and regularities are as Hume described it. But the folks involved with cause, with cause health, they're openly asking the question, is that really so? Some of the contributors from the study of philosophy propose that instead of Hume's take on causation as regularities, perhaps we should consider a dispositionless view of causation. For instance, if we conceive of things that have powers or tendencies in complex circumstances, we can reconceptualize the idea of causation as something that is, is nonlinear, whereby individual objects contain properties or powers that are responsible for effects. For instance, a glass has a power or disposition to fragility, a propensity to break when dropped to the floor. This seems so intuitive to me. It seems that such an account of causation explains why smoking causes cancer, but not every time. Lung cancer tends to follow smoking, given the right, albeit unfortunate, circumstances. It seems that such a view of causation might be able to explain a variety of medically unexplained symptoms, inclusive of irritable bowel, headaches, chronic fatigue, and chronic pain. Advocates for this view of causation propose that we could imagine a series of powers viewed as vectors pointed in opposite directions. In the case of a smoker, for instance, perhaps there's one larger power, smoking, that points to the left in the direction of cancer. But perhaps there are enough smaller powers. Dosing, genetics, activity levels come to mind, and they're pointing to the right. And the sum of the powers on the right exceeds that of the power towards cancer. So the patient doesn't develop cancer at all. Could the same be true for patients with painful complaints? It is with this principle in mind that Lowe wrote his latest article titled, Managing Complexity in Musculoskeletal Conditions, Reflections from a Physiotherapist. As I read it, I smiled and thought, ah, yes, maybe here we, we have the beginning of the answer. That is, of course, until I recalled a paper from Jeffrey Bishop that made me realize that my hopes, while admirable in my own mind, will ultimately probably fall short. You see, Cartesian dualism still pervades our work, even when we try to ignore the mind-body divide. Medicine, inclusive of therapy too, depending on the practitioner, it's a science after all. Science works from a basic design, observers observing the observed. The world, our patients included, are therefore considered manipulable to science. We do not, as Bishop asserts, quote, escape instrumental thinking about humans. We do not, excuse me, indeed it is because humanism is added to the biologism of medicine that it consummates its metaphysical relationship to medicine by asserting its usefulness to medicine. In a way, narrative medicine becomes a tool that gains the trust of a patient a more subtle tool because it has a potential to masquerade as authentic relationship, end quote. He argues that medicine necessarily views the patient as an animal machine in need of something else. Think about it. Medicine is an intervention. We add something to the patient to make them more complete, more robust. Sounds a lot like fixing, doesn't it? It's warm up here. How do we serve our patients within the flawed paradigm of a fixing profession? All the patient-centered model does is add more to the biopsychosocial approach under the guise of giving the patient more control. When that hasn't worked, we've added on something else still, the patient narrative. But even then, the patient narrative becomes instrumental. The more we understand our patients, after all, the more likely they are to do what we need them to do so that we can achieve what we consider to be a positive outcome. Ultimately, even with the best of intentions, it's about controlling yet another variable. And sure, maybe it works better than looking at the patient before us as a biomedical entity, but it seems to still fall short of service in the manner that we should try for. But of course, now I'm not talking about ideas that are about science. I'm talking about who we become, who we aim to be, who we should be, who and what our patients are. This is the stuff of philosophy, not science, at least not in the way that we conceive of science today. And I suppose that it is this less scientific thinking that has fueled my inquisitiveness these last few years. After all, it, it didn't take me long to grow tired of neuroscience readings. That isn't to say that it was beneath me. 
to the contrary, a lot of it was way over my head. And initially, I had to revisit old texts that had gathered dust and spider eggs in my basement. I had to spend a lot of time revisiting the basics, some of which I confess I never learned at all, all in an effort to discern with some, what some of the authors were writing about. And some were easier to understand than others, but each author seemed to arrive to similar conclusions. Activity in area A, region B, or network C strongly correlates with behavior X, sensation Y, or choice Z. So essentially, neuroscience, which is admittedly very much in its infancy as, much, as far as sciences are concerned, it explains things as, well, some physics happens, and then poof, experience. But it's that, it's that poof, it's that, that moment when electricity becomes experience that I have the most interest in, because that's where pain happens. And while neuroscience has excelled at reduction, digging deeper and looking with finer detail to explain many phenomena, it's that black box that is of greatest interest to me. It's that black box that might one day explain consciousness and experience of which pain is only a small aspect. And it's that black box which should feed our humility. Seriously, think about it. Our jobs are to interact with another human being to treat an ailment that we don't have access to. Yet, the treatment of pain should be primary. Right? I'm reminded of deep thinking college freshmen in philosophy 101 classes asking, how do you know that the red that you see is the same red that I see? In the same vein, isn't providing care for the treatment of painful complaints akin to someone walking into an ophthalmologist's office seeking treatment for their perceptions of reds as more saturated than they used to be or than that they want them to be? What would that mean exactly? How would we measure it? How would we identify what is normal? How would we decide to intervene? How does one treat consciousness? Science and neuroscience especially is, to date, mind you, really good at microviews and perspectives. It's good at collecting correlation data, but it still struggles with the more macro questions. Questions like pain. Questions to problems that we as providers are expected to deal with daily. Questions that we need answered if we're ultimately going to become proficient in providing care to individuals with painful complaints. So I started exploring some literature that ran adjacent to more straightforward neuroscience readings. I started to look more into neurophilosophy. And I remember being so resentful of Dr. John Quintner when he commented to Eric Kruger in a body and mind thread. He said, quote, a word of caution. Exploring the realms of consciousness, it's a job for highly experienced neurophilosophers. For us lesser mortals, it can be a swamp from which few of us emerge any the wiser. But now, four years later, I must confess that he was mostly right. Perhaps Eric is having more success as a greater mortal than I, but I remain stuck waist high in the muck of confusion and see no dry land in sight. But he was also wrong. There's a little bit of wisdom to be found waist high in the muck as well. Over these last five, six, seven years, I've discovered not only what I don't know, but also what I can't possibly know. There are people out there who have spent their entire academic lives researching and contemplating subjects that, after walking the dog, eating breakfast, putting the kids on the bus, going to work, coming home, shuttling the kids around, cleaning the dishes, spending a little bit of time with Christine, I get to read an occasional book on a single subject every few weeks that merely glosses over the material that an expert would scoff at as elementary. Look at the field of embodied cognition, for instance. The names in this field of study, if one were to pay attention to such matters, are intellectual heavyweights in every sense. Varela, Thompson, Clark, Noy, they're all writing about concepts and hypotheses that run contrary to the standard conceptual view of cognitive neuroscience. Yet, how the hell am I supposed to parse out who's right, who's wrong? These are folks that I admire, even if I don't know if I can or should agree with them. But let's be honest, too. Standard, standard cognitive neuroscience, well, sounding quite quaint, I admit, when someone refers to it as just as standard, it, it appears to have offered us legitimate explanations for a variety of phenomena at a staggering rate. Perception, attention, memory, language, categorization, problem solving. Each domain is currently explained in large part by standard cognitive neuroscience, a representational model that explains how the nervous system works. As I understand it, the prevailing standard view of the central nervous system is as a symbol manipulating device, a computer of sorts. At a physical level, neurons are individual cells that we can identify and label, but functionally in cognitive neuroscience, they act as symbols. They stand for, or represent things in the world via stimulation of bodily receptors in the periphery. The brain is now assumed to be computational. It is studied by means and analysis, because if we understand how the brain computates, we understand how the brain works, 
how you and I think or cognize. Lauren Shapiro says, quote, all the action, so to speak, his quotes, not mine, begins and ends where the computational processes touch the world. The cause of the inputs and effect on the world that the outputs produce are, from this perspective, irrelevant for the purposes of understanding the computational process taking place in the space between input and output. Standard cognitive neuroscience tends to draw the boundaries of cognition at the same place a computer scientist might draw the boundaries of computation at the points of interface with the world. Cognition is computation. Computation happens over symbols. symbols. Symbols begin with inputs to and outputs from the brain, and so it is in the brain alone that cognition takes place, and it is with the brain alone that cognitive science need concern itself. A computer is a passive receiver of information. People certainly are not. But still, even if our current means or concepts in studying cognitive sciences were to be modified, altered, or tweaked, be replaced to what extent? Varela, Thompson, and others advocate for viewing cognition not as computation, but as embodied action. This is to say that they aim to emphasize, once again, that sensory and motor processes, perception and action, they're fundamentally inseparable. As you and I move through a room, our movement will produce opportunities for new perceptions while simultaneously eliminating the opportunities for others. By the same logic, the new perceptions reveal opportunities for new movements. So movement influences and constrains perceptions, which in turn influence and constrain available motions, which then constrain new perceptions, and yada, yada, yada. Maybe I'm not just my brain after all. In this view, an action doesn't result as an output from a perceived input, but rather movement and perception are inextricably linked. They determine each other. But there are still others who think that the standard computational view falls short in other ways. Lakoff and Johnson argue that the peculiar nature or shape of our bodies it actually shapes the possibilities for conceptualization and categorization. That language shapes the way we think and determines what we think about. They assert that within language, the essence of metaphor is understanding and experiencing one kind of thing or experience in terms of another, a, a roundabout means of expanding how we may understand experiences beyond basic concepts. And it's the basic concepts part, though, that seems to interest me the most at the moment. Their notion of basic concepts appears to hinge on concepts of relation, up, down, front, back, left, right. These basic concepts do not require metaphor for understanding only experience. But what does left mean to a, a worm? They don't have a front, a back, or a top, or a bottom. What about a thought experiment, about a spherical being in outer space? Where's their left, their right? They're up, down, front, or back. Lakoff and Johnson argue that how we think, the language we use, even at the most basic level, is necessarily embodied. And there are still others who assert that cognition emerges from a dynamic system with a brain interacting dynamically within a body, dynamically interacting with its environment. In such a view, we can't really understand activity of the brain without also at the same time understanding activities taking place in the body and the world. The boundaries of cognitive system are thereby expanded Cognition might actually emerge not just from the brain, but from the interaction of multiple dynamic systems. In our case, brain, body, and environment. But that still feels a bit dualistic, doesn't it? Just with the add-on of the area the body interacts with? Isn't it possible to view the entire nervous system, central and peripheral as a whole, interacting with an environment? Is that a different sort of duality that we could get behind? I don't think I know. And what if rather than expanding the mind, we consider the mind to be merely extended? That is how Andy Clark thinks it all works. In Clark's view, gestures are part of the cognitive apparatus. So, so too are scribbles in a notebook. He writes, quote, these are the cases when we confront a recognizably cognitive process running in some agent that creates outputs, speech, gesture, expressive movements, written words that recycled as inputs drive the cognitive process along, end quote. Gestures become means of spatial reasoning. Another example is my use of my cell phone's assistant to set reminders to offload my remembrances to my device, same as Otto's notebook. Words and reminders in this instance serve as a self-generated external structure on thought and reason. If our memory simply stores bits of information, does it really matter whether those bits are in wetware or a piece of paper or our cell phones? Are any of these conceptions of mind accurate? Which, if any, could be considered the truth? Which are more likely than they are right? And how small does a likelihood need to be for us to not consider it at least possible, even if it's not likely? I don't know about you, but I don't know how to decide, and I can't know. 
Clark's been beating the drum for the Bayesian predictive mind as well. Of course, Bayes' theorem is a bit counterintuitive to begin with. I hadn't really thought about it much until I started reading Howie, and frankly, I had no idea I was so shitty at probability. For instance, if a woman told me that she had a positive finding on a mammogram and that the test detects breast cancer 80% of the time, I'd fear for her, never thinking that she has less than 8% risk of actually having cancer. Even as I write and now read it now, I feel as though I need to retrace my intellectual steps to assure that I'm right, even though I know for certain that I am. But the numbers just, they feel so unnatural. Yet Howie, Clark, Friston, and others are telling us that our brains employ that same kind or style of statistical analyses when perceiving and acting in our world. Predictive coding. Sounds a bit futuristic, right? In their view, not only are our brains not passive receivers of inputs, but they create our experiences primarily via top-down processes, not bottom-up. When I drive my car to the end of my street, come to rest adjacent to the stop sign and look to my left, my mind has already predicted what I will see. When I turn my attention to the right, my mind has already predicted what I will see there. Meanwhile, when I look to the left again and see a cyclist that I almost strike with my car, a cyclist that seems to have appeared from nowhere in particular, I'm surprised and relieved to have seen him when I did. I wonder how it happened that I didn't see them the first time, and for a very brief moment, I wonder what else I may have missed. I think, too, about selective attention, of course, until I get distracted by my car stereo and my mind wanders elsewhere. By the predictive coding account, higher levels in the brain distant from various environmental sensors at our periphery, they're making educated guesses about the barrage of sensory input that's coming into the brain, and they're very strategic about how much it processes that data. Prediction errors report signal surprises, differences between predicted and actual signals to higher levels in the brain. By such a process, the brain need only process the bits of information that it didn't predict accurately. It could ignore all the other sensory bits that it predicted or guessed right. Kind of like encoded video, and perhaps you've never had to put much thought into it, but when your kids and grandkids take a movie from a DVD and put it on their computer, they're able to take four gigabytes of information and reduce it to 20% of its original size. The way that software engineers accomplish this is by using software that only keeps track of changes between the frames in the movie. Imagine for a moment that you've got a small three by five spiral notebook, you know, like detectives used to use in the old films, and you, take a, and you draw a small thin circle on the far left margin of that first page, and then on each of the next 30 pages, you draw the same little circle, but you move it incrementally a little farther and farther until it hits the right margin. Now when you flip through those pages, you can see the ball or circle move from one side of the page to the other. Now imagine you wanted to take that flipbook and you wanted to store that animation digitally. You place your pages one by one on a scanner. We scan just color, no grays, just blacks and whites. With those settings, a piece of paper would require 169 kilobytes of storage space. Multiply by 30 pages, 5,000 kilobytes of information for that animation. But if we only record the difference between frames, we only need to have an image to start with, consider it a prediction of sorts. And then, most of the image will remain the same. All we need to do is take a, a few select pixels, excuse me, and switch them back and forth. And if we assume that little ball only, were only half an inch in diameter, we only need to account for 950 pixels that change from page to page. Now, instead of storing 5,000 kilobytes of information, we only need, need to store and process 169 for that initial prediction, an additional 0.11 kilobytes for the few changes that follow, a 97% reduction in the amount of information that needs to be processed. And the 169 kilobyte version is gonna be indistinguishable from the 5,000 kilobyte version. Now, I grant you that my flipbook example is very rudimentary, but proponents of prediction error minimization argue that the brain works to encode information in similar ways. In doing so, brains are able to process a great amount of information with spectacular efficiency. Sticking with vision as an example, it's argued that the brain uses a top-down method of first predicting using, predicting using Bayesian methodology what we should see, and then it plays a type of match game. You know, like when we're kids, hoping that the cards that we flip over, that in succession, they're gonna look alike. When the predictions coming from the top are met with an expected signal traveling from the bottom, the message from the bottom needn't be processed any further. To do so would be a waste of valuable energy and resources. 
For instance, if I'm staring at a blank white wall, my mind need not entirely reconstruct what I see after each occasion that I blink. To do so would be a waste of energy. The brain simply predicts what sensory information and data will be traveling through the optic nerves when my eyes reopen, and the information needn't be processed very heavily. Only when a prediction seems wrong, when a prediction error occurs, for instance, if you placed a picture of a bluebird in my visual field mid-blink, only then will such new and important information work its way toward the top, toward higher brain centers, until the ever-dynamic prediction manifests in a way that aligns with the incoming sensory input. And so this process continues ad infinitum, not just for our vision perception, but for each and every perception. Hearing, smell, touch, pain. Perhaps Mick Thacker will have something to share with us in the future with regards to the latter. Maybe not. I, I can't know. And this is just the sensory stuff. Friston's work on motor action is some serious next level shit. I don't even know where to begin because it's so far over my head. First, I tried to read a couple of articles, but the dude has a 30-page paper on action and behavior in a journal titled Biological Cybernetics. Hell, I didn't even know biological cybernetics was a thing. I've tried to listen to his lectures, hoping that I can make heads or tails of it, but it's daunting, and at the same time, it's laughable. To think that I can just sit down and listen to a guy with a PhD in neuroscience talk about the mathematics involved and how the brain makes efficient inferences via a variant of the free energy principle, while myself only possessing a clinical doctorate in a subject primarily grounded in basic anatomy and kinesiology? I mean, seriously, what could I possibly expect? I need three to four years of bachelor studies in mathematics, statistics, and probably in neuroscience, too, to discern if anything he says makes sense theoretically. And that's even before thinking about whether or not his ideas might actually be accurate or correct. But then the more neuroscience I had read, the more that the mind, even, it, even if it is embodied, it's still understood as a mere machine of sorts. Eventually, regardless of where we draw the lines between us and the world, we're situated in, we still need to ask, what is consciousness then if we're able to reduce the machinations of our nervous system to physics? How does subjective experience arise or emerge from a physical, material world, what Chalmers has famously called the hard problem of consciousness? Is consciousness just an illusion, an evolutionary byproduct? If, if it were an illusion, what does it mean for our experience, our patient's experiences, our patient's pain? What does it mean when I ask a patient to explain to me how and what they are feeling? What should I expect when I ask a patient to engage in a behavior that I think, or at least I think I think, may be beneficial to them? If there's no longer any space or room for the notion of a libertarian free will, you know, the good old ability to pick ourselves up by our bootstraps and engage in behavior as we see fit, what kind of will are we able to exercise at all? Many in the hard sciences don't think that we have a free will. Of course, some philosophers like Dennett, they hold out hope for a free will that is somehow still compatible with the material view of the world, a free will worth wanting, I think he calls it. But I've heard him talk about the horrible consequences of if people fail to believe in free will. And I've wondered if much of his views, that's better. I was wondering if much of his views, they're ironically unintentional, motivated reasoning. I know that I certainly hold out hope and, and motivated to find a, a glimmer of hope for the preservation of my own free will. That is, of course, when I'm motivated to feel anything at all. Last year, I wrote a blog post about an experience that was too personal for me to publish at the time, although I did share my story with a few, some of whom will probably be in San Diego and are. Um, it was titled, I've Taken Myself for Granted. I wrote, I am a thinker, a ponderer. I am a stoic. I'm rational. I'm patient. I enjoy reading and learning. I'm loyal. I love my wife with all my heart and my children somehow even more. I'm me. I was me. That is, until it became harder to think, until I was overwhelmed with emotion, holding back tears daily, until I was irritated by the mundane, until I couldn't concentrate enough or read, I, I, until my wife's idiosyncrasies brought on thoughts of separation, until I started contemplating how much life was really worth living at all. I used to be me. Now I feel as though I'm someone different. Or was I someone else, a different person, and now I am me? 
all iterations of me have lived under the premise that a person is not their shell alone. No, a person's not defined by their physical body. They can't be. The body constantly turns over new cells. The physical structure of my body only resembles in form the body that I had a few years ago. And actually, not even that. Um, no, I am my mind embodied. But if my mind, my thoughts, and behaviors change, then what if not my body makes me me? Is it my history, my memories? I have a recollection of my past, a timeline along which myself has theoretically traveled, yet I lose my memories as well. I don't remember stories that I once did, and there are some memories I'm uncertain. Did they ever really happen, or are they only embellishments, rewritten as memories? And if my history informs myself, but the memory of my history erodes, is myself eroded as well? Do I become less of who I was? Or are there certain important memories that inform myself? Well, it is the unimportant memories that can erode without effect. References are full of Phineas Gages, who have suffered physical traumas, John Nash's, Sid Barrett's, and Demi Lovato's, who suffer from chemical imbalances that change and alter their selves. I read of athletes with CTE and work with elderly suffering from dementia, and I'm offered an example of how fragile the self is. I wonder how different they truly are from me. Do everyone's selves change as often as the afflicted, only not as drastically? What if we are never ourselves in the way we think or feel we are? What if ourselves are necessarily more fluid, more flexible than we perceive them to be? I've learned a harsh lesson. I now recognize that myself is a subjective and qualitative thing that I have no control of, despite the illusion that I once did. Next week, I'll begin treatment for Graves' disease. Over the next few months, the biochemical reactions that make me me will be altered. I don't know if I'll be the person that I was, but I'm quite certain I won't be the person I am. None of it will be my own doing. I'll have no more control of who I, come, who I become tomorrow than I did of who I was yesterday. I wonder if I'll read this six months from now and question how I could have been so nihilistic. Today, it doesn't feel as though that could be possible but I know that nothing should surprise me either. Now, I know it reads as really dramatic now, but man, I've been depressed before, Barrett, but that particular episode was like nothing I'd ever experienced. I was thinking about some pretty dark shit from a really dark place, and it completely destroyed the illusion that I was who or what I thought I was. I discovered that the self was more fluid than I ever thought it could be. My values shifted more dramatically than they ever had before. I lost purpose. It became clear to me that there wasn't anything that made me, me, no essence. And that is when, on the advice of a friend, I started watching and reading about some of Deacon's ideas. And maybe they're not his alone, I don't know. I only know that it is through him that I've been exposed. Bruce Hood says that the self is an illusion, and he might be right in the context that we usually consider selves as nouns, things or people that we are. Deacon's account of selves as processes is a different one than the average person may employ, though, and by proxy so, too, is Sherman's, whose book is a much easier read, although still challenging to me anyway. Materialist accounts of the world as we know it don't account for values, likes, or motives. They don't account for what it means to be a self. They don't account for meaning. They don't account for what Sherman calls striving. It isn't physics that compels a patient to seek care for painful complaints. They're striving for something, are they not? They strive to reduce, better control, or abolish their pain, right? And pain is information, no? What meaning does it have for who? The materialist accounts that I mentioned above, they predominantly observe humans through the lens of physics, not chemistry. But we and all selves, as termed by, by Sherman, should necessarily be observed as biology, chemistry constrained in specific conditions and circumstances from which life emerges. In this regard, it is a categorical mistake to consider selves as mere fancy, probabilistic wetware machines with neat environmental interfaces. We strive, but we're not unique in this regard. All selves strive. Organisms, beings, plants, bacterium, creatures big and small, all things biological. We make effort working for our own benefit. When a computer does work, it does so for us. Computers and machines don't strive, selves do. 
selves, according to Sherman, are unique in the physical world because we strive to resist the second law of thermodynamics, albeit mostly unconsciously. The rest of the physical world is flowing toward entropy, toward disorder, but not us. Our bodies, ourselves, as it were, work to regenerate. Machines and computers are not cells because they don't regenerate. They're not striving. We are, but chemistry can't explain how or why. We make efforts for our own benefit in response to the circumstances that we are embedded in. Chemistry cannot explain that. Neuroscience can show correlates in the brain between inputs and perceptions, intentions and actions, but it will not be able to explain striving because, stri because neuroscience studies computation. It studies the person as an embodied computing machine, not the person as a striving self. Sherman asserts in a talk at Google that when you try to go from computation to qualia, you just made Chalmers' hard problem the made harder problem. And Sherman openly acknowledges that to use the term striving self, it's still a placeholder for something that science has yet to explain. It's not a scientific explanation in and of itself. It's an observation, an important observation. We have wants, a will, but there's not yet a scientific explanation for how it is that we will, as obvious as it is to us that we have it. We have a will to live, all organisms do. They might not know or feel like we do, but there's a striving to live and self-regenerate. Even when I was at my lowest consciously, I didn't cease to regenerate. No, I, I still did work to regenerate, to stay alive, even while I pondered if I should. Sherman argues that will started with chemistry that by accident was biased toward doing work against petering out, a bias to self-regenerate, a constraint that prevents degeneration. In this way, to even consider the notion of free will, it's an oxymoron. Freedom, after all, is the idea that anything goes, but the will constrains. The focused will is proactive and affords the self to pursue its wants and priorities, the freedom to follow its biases in the direction of means sense interpretation. Sherman says, quote, bless you, you're not, quote, you're not choosing what to do free and independent of all outside circumstances. You're willfully and attentively responsively interpreting outside circumstances, doing biased and interpretive work for your own benefit, especially in humans, given our use of language. It's interpretation gone wild in visionary, delusional, in unpredictable ways. In this manner of thinking, humans don't arise to a level of consciousness that begets will. Instead, will is endowed in all selves as they interpret their environment and do self-directed effort for their own benefit. Or at least that's what I think they're saying. I'm still trying to wrap my head around it all, to be honest, and still, I would need more education than I have time for, than I could possibly afford to begin to even think about offering a legitimately critical appraisal of Deacon and Sherman's perspective. And even if I did, I wonder still about the consequences of our consideration of people with painful complaints. In their narrative, the will is about interpretation. Interpretation is filtered through values and meaning for each self, clustered in a community nested in other communities beset by the ubiquity of cultures embedded in cultures. Kind of makes the term biopsychosocial sound trite, doesn't it? Four years ago, John Quintner said I'd be no wiser. Well, not me, he was talking to Eric, but I'm the one who took it personally. And he was kind of right. I'm certainly not any smarter. I don't know more now than before. I am aware of more ideas, though. I do know more about what I don't know and what I can never be certain of. And I do think that there's wisdom in that. Perhaps that is what I should try to talk about in San Diego. Although if I were in their seats, I don't know if I would find it all that interesting, and I'm not sure I could sit through a talk that would try to hit on all these ideas in 50 minutes. Each idea alone would be worthy of its own keynote talk from a more qualified presenter, I think. Perhaps instead I should share with them my premise, not that I think my premise should matter much to them. Do others really care if I aim to serve patients in pain with humility in the face of ever-increasing uncertainty? In an environment that might be surrounding a situated body with an embodied and maybe even predictive mind? That each of us might possess just enough freedom to make a limited number of narrowed choices? That those choices might be made in a causal world of powers and dispositions? 
that the only advice I have to offer is that each of us should try to consider all that may be possible and then do our damnedest not to be an accidental asshole after? I don't know. What I do know is that this thinking shit is a lot of work, Barrett. Isn't it just easier to do some manual therapy? <laughs> to push on this, pull on that, a little friction here and there with some soft language and tones? And then as an add-on of sorts, consider how someone's psycho or sociological history may somehow tweak their experience? Does considering all this shit make anyone a better therapist? If it does, I don't know if I found the way. Paralysis by analysis is the phrase people use, and I'll be damned if it isn't apropos here. But as for the summit, I still don't know what to say, but I'll figure something out. I've, I've got to, right? There are only four months left until I'm standing on that stage, trying my best to avoid coming across as an imposter. And I hope you are well, Barrett. I miss your daily writings, but I'm buoyed by the thought that you're still out there reading whatever interests you. And thanks again for all that you've given to me over the years. I sincerely appreciate it, and I wouldn't be where I am without you. Your friend, Keith. Thank you. He warned me he was going over because he figured everyone would be sleeping. Um, does anyone have questions or anything for Keith? Don't prove him right. He said there'd be no questions. <laughs> Wait, hold on. We need the microphone. No, no, because the people online. Sorry, up here in the front. Oh, the what was Barrett's response? <laughs> The question, the question uh, was, what was Barrett's response? And uh, I don't remember the exact word, to be honest with you, but uh, he said uh, he, that, he was, that he was touched, and, and that was it. He was, he's a man of few words sometimes. <laughs> uh, but this is the link. I, I know I threw a whole bunch of shit out there, and I just threw it up against the wall. Um, but this was the longest blog post I ever wrote, and Rajam is kind enough to uh, give me permission to post it on her site. So, and it's all hyperlinked. Every author, everything I talked about, uh, it's an opportunity for other people to uh, investigate some of the things that I've investigated over the last few years, maybe pique someone's interest. But uh, uh, again, you can find all the references and the links to people's uh, Twitter accounts and different books, and it's all, it's all in there, different articles, et cetera. Okay, so we have Joe in the back, and then there's one up here. Which you can... I don't have a question. I just wanted to thank you for your bravery and for bringing the whole of you to this. It was beautiful. Cool. Thank you, Joe. I second that, Keith. Thank you. And could you maybe reflect on one noticeable way that your practice has changed when you're sitting in a room with a patient across from another person from all the things that you've read, whether you feel like you've arrived or not? The, Tim hit on this really, really well. I was talking to, Richard asked a question during, at the end of Tim's talk, and, and I was smiling as he asked, you know, well, how do you, how do you put all this stuff into, what kind of a model, is there something out there? And, and Tim's response was, you know what, you just got to, I'm just reflective. Uh, and, and then I was grinning huge when you're like, I spent, I spent whatever, four years, I think you said, going, auditing, you know, your own, your own patients. And, and that was, and I kind of did the same. Um, I would uh, re-listen to conversations that I had with patients and uh, I would really concentrate on how my posturing, uh, really just trying to be present as much as I possibly could, knowing that that knowing how little I know, I guess, is, is what it came down to. I mean, knowing what some of the data tells us and, and following it in that direction to, 
uh, as in the class that I, I taught about, you know, just not trying to be that asshole by accident, because we're all trying to help, um, but really making sure that I tuned into, again, what was possible. And, and it all kind of even tied in with, you know, with a lot of Barrett's uh, neuroses as well, as far as his detail. And his is much more analytical than mine was when I would engage and, and talk with him. But uh, it's, just, it's just that it's about the person. And I, again, I got an argument, uh, not an argument, it was a healthy conversation. Because, uh, no, because he's, he's an awesome guy and, and argument is not a fair word. Um, but I was talking with Steve Camper in Chicago at Sarah's, and my, I really don't like biopsychosocial, um, and it, because I think it, I think in many people's, and I know it's not what the, the actual researchers say, and they, they're they're thinking of in a bigger picture, um, but I think when it gets in the hands of clinicians, I think it just becomes an itemized checklist, and uh, and that's if I were to take it, and this is a meandering answer, but I think that is probably the biggest take home for me is that uh, to try to pull back and have that wide angle view and not just try to itemize this person's BPS and, and, and go from there. Um, anything online or anyone else? Nothing online? Um, So what are you going to read tomorrow? <laughs> I'm, I miss you, Richard. I'm sorry? What are you going to read tomorrow? What you... Tomorrow I'm reading a science fiction book on the way home. <laughs> Straight fiction. <laughs> I'll, let you, I'll let you know if it's good. I, I know the crying mother, and I know the daughter. She's my stepdaughter, and she's doing much better now. So some of the things that we've learned have helped. So unfortunately, she's still a teenager, so we're just kind of waiting that one out. <laughs> Those are tears for a whole other reason. <laughs> Thank you. And what was there a hand? Yeah, over there. Thank you for speaking from the heart. Um, my question is, you differentiated between fixing, helping, and serving. Um, do you have any suggestions for patients that come to you and say, or clients and say, you fixed me? Because someone did that to me last week and I said, oh, well, I'm, I'm glad to hear you're doing better. You know, <laughs> because I didn't want to challenge her and be like, well, we don't really fix you. It's the circumstances and it's a relationship. So anything from your own experience you can share? It depends on the relationship that I have with someone. I mean, so don't get me wrong, sometimes you get those folks and you've only seen them, you know, two or three times and they feel miraculously better and they want to give you all the credit for that. Uh, and, and those are the ones that I try to disarm them a little bit and, and say, you know, I think, th and remind them of how, uh, my boss hates the term because I use it a lot, but how strong and robust they are. And I try to influence about, you know, I, hopefully I've given them at least a little bit of understanding of how the body pardon me, how it heals, um, and I'm able to tap back on that a little bit, just as like a gentle reminder. Um, but even then, in that instance, it's not, in that, I'm always saying, I'm glad that I was here for you. I'm always here if you need something else. Because next time, hopefully, they'll come to me, and then I've got a few more days to remind them of how they're the ones that are healing themselves, and, and I just serve as, a, as we talked about, a, a catalyst more than anything. And, um, and I think that's the, the best answer I could give for that one. All right, well, now you're off the hook. That's all the time we have. Um, so we'll be back at 1230 for the last speaker before lunch.